All right, well, grab your Bibles, if you have them, and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 2 will be in verses 13 to 17 in our time together. And the question we're going to be considering this evening is, why was Jesus in the Gospels described as a friend of sinners? Why was Jesus described as a friend of sinners? It's interesting to note that Jesus was accused of a number of things during his earthly ministry. We learned about one of those accusations last time we were together in the first 12 chapters of, first 12 verses of chapter 2 uh, when Jesus did a miracle in a crowded home. If you remember, there were scribes who accused Jesus of being a blasphemer, of blaspheming God. If you remember what happened, there was a house and Jesus was teaching there and his popularity is growing, his fame is spreading and so everybody wants to see Jesus. Everyone wants to hear Jesus. Everyone's talking about Jesus. He does miracles, he does signs, he does wonders, he can heal the sick and so everybody's like pushing into this house to the point that no one else can get in. And there are four friends who bring their paralytic friend and they notice they can't get into the door either. This man is limited because of the paralysis in his body and so they're such good friends they'll do whatever it takes to get their friend to Jesus. If you remember because they couldn't get in the door they climb on the roof and they break through the roof and they lower their friend who has paralysis throughout his body and lower him down right before Jesus and he's there and I'm sure at that moment you could hear a pin drop. Everybody's waiting to hear what Jesus is going to say and do. And he's done it in the past. He says, take up your bed and walk. But Jesus does something more incredible, something incredibly surprising to everyone there. He says, son, your sins are forgiven you. And Jesus can read hearts because he's God and he sees that the scribes are thinking in their hearts, why is he blaspheming God? Why is he blaspheming God? Because only God can forgive sins. And Jesus says, you want to know how I can say your sins are forgiven? I am God. And if you want me to prove that the Son of Man came to forgive sins, and he commands the man, take up your bed and go home. And he takes up his bed and walks out. And if you remember, everybody is standing there amazed. Jaws drop down to the ground and they're glorifying God and they're saying, we've never seen anything like it. Well, they accused Jesus of blasphemy in the first 12 verses. Now we're gonna see how Jesus is accused and, and uh, those objectors call him a friend of sinners and they don't like it. And we're gonna consider what that means for Jesus to be a friend of sinners, what it means for, for us to follow him. What does it mean for us to follow Jesus who didn't come to be served but came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many to call upon sinners to repent and believe and to receive forgiveness of their sins and the gift of everlasting life. And so Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, reads this way. Then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay, so why was Jesus called a, a friend of sinners? Luke 7, 34 puts it this way. The son of man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus knew that people called him a friend of sinners, but why did they call him a friend of sinners? And is it justified? And if he truly is a friend of sinners, what does that mean for us? If we're gonna follow Jesus, the friend of sinners, what is, how does that impact our ministry and our calling if we've been called to follow Jesus and to be fishers of men? And the question is, are we following him as he's called us to? 
Uh, first reason Jesus is called a friend of sinners is because he called sinners to follow him. Verses 13 to 14, he called all of his disciples who were sinners to follow him. And we're going to read about Levi in verses 13 to 14, who is also a, a known sinner. If you're with us back in chapter 1, Jesus had called four fishermen, Peter and Andrew. If you remember, he was walking by the Sea of Galilee and he saw them and he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They left everything and they followed Jesus. And then he walked a little further, saw another pair of brothers, James and John, with their father Zebedee and his servants in the boat and said, follow me. And they left everything and they followed Jesus. Well, now we get to see he's about to call the first tax collector. Wow. You know, we don't know any other names of tax collectors in the first century but one, and we're going to talk about him in a moment. His name is Levi. Listen, the disciples had different backgrounds, different occupations they came from. Some were fishermen, some were tax collectors, some come from other backgrounds. But here's something they all had in common. They're all sinners. And I can imagine every single one of us have different backgrounds and come from different places. Some of us are from Oregon. Some of us are from other locations. Some of us have different occupations that we serve and work in. Some of us do what we do. But all of us have something in common. We're sinners. And if we're called to follow Jesus, we are disciples who have been called to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus. So why is Jesus called a friend of sinners? Well, because he called sinners to be disciples. And if sinners can be transformed into disciples, fully devoted followers of Christ who deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him, how should that impact our ministry? And we get to see how he called Levi, right? First, we see in verse 13 the setting. The setting tells us in verse 13, then he went again by the sea and all the multitude came to him and he taught them. Jesus is once again walking by the sea. As I just said earlier, it's very familiar. Remember when Peter and Andrew, James and John, fishermen of Capernaum were called. Now, it doesn't tell us specifically where on the Sea of Galilee he called them. Probably if we're, we've been in Capernaum in the region of Galilee, it's probably the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, which is where Capernaum is at. And it says that Jesus is walking along the sea there and a multitude starts to gather. Why? Because everyone wants to see Jesus. Everyone's heard about Jesus. His popularity is growing. His fame is spreading. And you may not believe in him. You may believe he's this or you may believe he's that. But everyone has an opinion about Jesus. So everyone wants to see what they've heard about him. And so a multitude starts to gather around him. And what does Jesus do? Jesus teaches them. What was the purpose for why Jesus came back in chapter 1, verse 38? Jesus' ultimate purpose was not to heal the sick and deliver the afflicted. That was part of his ministry. He had a heart for the hurting, and so when people came and were hurting, he healed them. But his ultimate purpose was to preach. And what did he preach? If you go back to chapter 2, I believe, chapter 1, verse 15, it said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand repent and believe. He said, the time is fulfilled. Hey, you've been waiting for a Messiah, the king of the Jews, to arrive? I'm here. The kingdom of God is fulfilled. The king has arrived. So what you need to do is you need to repent, turn from your sin, and turn and believe on me. So that's the setting. Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. Multitudes are gathering, and he is Teaching. As he's been teaching throughout the region of Galilee and in and around Capernaum, I can imagine Levi has been listening. You can't be in Capernaum or in the region of Galilee while Jesus is beginning his ministry and everybody's talking about him to not heard about him or at least listen to some of his messages. And it's very possible that as he was teaching, we don't know exactly what he taught, but most likely the kingdom of God is at hand. R repent and believe so that when Jesus comes and calls him, he's ready and prepared to turn from his sin, turn from his old way of life and follow Jesus wherever he leads him to go. So the setting, we get it, we picture it. Can you see it by the Sea of Galilee? Can you smell it? Can you see the, the wind kind of blowing and the waves crashing? And, and as Jesus is walking along the way, he is going to call him. And verse 14 says, and he passed by. 
he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. Three things. He passed by Levi. He saw Levi, and he called Levi. Number one, he passed by Levi. Was it by accident? You know, he's just going about what Jesus does. No, I want you to know when he passed by Levi, it was a divine appointment. It was divinely orchestrated that Jesus would be walking along the Sea of Galilee at this moment, at this time, as he's preaching to the multitudes and teaching about the kingdom of God. And there he sees him. He passes by him. It was a divine appointment. And I just want to pause here for a moment and for you to think back on your life concerning the certain divine appointments that God has set up for you throughout your life. Divine appointments to hear the truth of the gospel. Divine appointments with key individuals who are believers who introduced you to the truth of Jesus and to the gospel. It could be a family member. It could be a friend. It could be a random stranger. It could be a Gideon who handed you a Bible. I don't know what it was, but there are divine appointments that God has set up for you throughout your life in order to call you to himself or draw you closer to himself. You read about divine appointments all throughout Scripture. I wanted to read a couple examples. For instance, in Acts 8, 26 to 29, the Ethiopian eunuch had a divine appointment with a man by the name of Philip, and it was divinely orchestrated. Let me read it to you. Acts 8, 26 says this. Now an angel of the Lord spoke, spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Philip doesn't know what's going to happen. He, but he obeys and he's available. And then it says, this is the desert. So he arose and went and behold, a man of Ethiopia. In other words, he looks up and can you see him? A man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians who had a charge over all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Divine appointment. Have you ever saw somebody whom God was pressing you to go talk to? or to open your mouth and to share your testimony or the gospel with, or simply you were present at just the right time and you felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit who said, turn the conversation towards spiritual things. Have you ever said, Lord, open up an opportunity for me to share my faith, and then it's right before you and say, Lord, can you give me a sign to make sure this is the one that you've called me to do? And then verse 28 says, he was returning and sitting in the chariot. He was reading the Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. That's a divine appointment. You keep reading. It's an incredible story. He's reading Isaiah. And Philip comes up to him and says, do you know what you're reading? Ethiopian eunuch says, how am I supposed to know unless someone tells me? And Philip explains to him how Isaiah the prophet is fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is Jesus Christ the Lord. And he believes on the Lord Jesus and he says, Hey, does anything keep me from getting baptized? Or can I, can I get baptized? Does anything keep me from being baptized? He said, do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? He said, I believe with all my heart. And he was baptized right there on the side of the road. And then all of a sudden, Philip just disappeared, right? He disappeared, ended up continuing to minister for the Lord. That's a divine appointment. Now, your divine appointment may have not been like that, but it was a divine appointment appointment and God has divinely orchestrated events and people to come into your life. Now, that's a fun one because it's bringing someone to salvation, but did you know God sets up divine appointments in terms of even using suffering to accomplish his purposes? That's one I don't necessarily want to hear. But what you see is that even though God is not the cause of suffering, he doesn't waste the suffering. And even though people may cause the suffering, he's going to use it to accomplish his good purposes. Nonetheless, and a perfect example of that is Joseph. Joseph is a 17-year-old. He's a, favored by his father, and he, he was so bold to tell his brothers, hey, you know, I'm going to be greater than all of you, including dad, and you're all going to bow down to me pretty much. And they did not like that. They threw him in a pit. They wanted to kill him, but they said, hey, Forget killing him, at least we can make some money off of him. And so they sell him off in slavery. Ends up in Potiphar's house. And over the next 17 years, 17 years, he's suffering. He ends up in Potiphar's house, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Ends up getting thrown into prison. Interprets some dreams there. He has a glimmer of hope and they forget about him. 
And then 17 years later, from the pit of prison, he is elevated in a moment's notice to the pinnacle of power and is the second most powerful man in the land of Egypt, second to Pharaoh. And what happens to Joseph next is God positioned him there so that during these years of famine, he could not just help the Egyptians, but he could help God's chosen people, his brothers, his dad, and his family to sustain them through that famine. And guess what? In the, towards the end of Genesis, he meets his brothers again. And his brothers, when they find out it's him, they are about to have a heart attack. <laughs> They're thinking he's going to seek revenge on us. Now let me read to you what he says in Genesis 50, 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me. Here's the divine orchestration of God in using suffering to accomplish his purposes. But God meant it for good. Doesn't matter the evil that has been done to you. No matter if you've been abused, neglected, thrown in a pit to die, if you've been thrown in prison, falsely accused, ended up as a forgotten individual, God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. That's a divine appointment. And God can use even suffering to accomplish his divine purposes. You may be going through suffering, you may have gone through suffering, but can I ask you to encourage you to ask God, Lord, how are you using this for your good? To accomplish your greater purposes for my good and for your glory. That's a divine appointment. And there are divine appointments happening. And the question is, are, are we ready? Are we willing and available when they arrive? And so Jesus, he just passed by him, but it wasn't an accident. It wasn't by chance. No, this is all divinely orchestrated by God. God is in charge of the smallest details of our lives. I like to put it this way. God is in charge of the drama in my life. You know, when things happen to me and I say, where did that come from? God's still in control. He still sits on the throne of heaven no matter how the elections end up in November. Praise the Lord. He's still on his throne and he reigns and rules over all. And so he passed by him. Secondly, he saw him. What did he see? Well, he's there in his tax office. He's there in his seat and Jesus sees him. And I want you to know Jesus sees him in the same way he sees us. He sees the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now you think of a tax collector, you might think, oh, it's the IRS and no one likes getting taxed in general. But the tax collectors in the first century were especially disliked, especially if you were a Jew. And the reason was because you were seen as an individual who worked for Rome, who was the enemy. And you were employed by Herod Antipas and you collected taxes on behalf of Rome. But not only that, you, you collected a certain amount that you could choose above and beyond what was required and you got plenty of money in your pocket. And so these tax collectors were rich at the expense of their own people, the Jews. So Levi is a Jew, but in their eyes, he's a traitor. It's one thing to be a fisherman, okay? Everyone's, you know, not perfect. Everyone's a sinner. But those tax collectors, oh, those are the worst of the worst. It's one thing for a fisherman to follow Jesus, but a tax collector, that's a whole nother thing. Listen, Jesus knew exactly who he was passing by. Jesus knew exactly who he was about to call to follow him. He was a tax collector. And we don't know if he was dishonest or not like the rest of the tax collectors, but what we do know is he was disliked. And for Jesus to choose a tax collector to follow him, to add to his disciples among the 12, man, that's controversial. Jesus is making some crazy decisions, at least in the eyes of of the Jews and especially in the eyes of the Jewish leaders. Jesus saw him. I want to share some, some scriptures and how Jesus sees us and I want you to know he's able to read our hearts. Did you know when Jesus called you to himself, he already knew you were a sinner and he knew all about your deep, dark secrets that you don't tell anybody about. He knew all about your sin that you would commit in the past, in the present, and in the future. I want you to know he still loves you and he still loves me. Hebrews 4.13 says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. That's scary. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Whew, he knows everything. 
He knows those hidden sins. He knows those thoughts. He knows those actions that no one else knows about. He knows our deep, dark secrets. Of Psalm 139, one through four, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. I can't go anywhere without you. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways for there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, O Lord, you know it all together. He knows about those anxious thoughts where you're not trusting him and I'm not trusting him. He knows about those sinful desires and how you and I give in to our temptations from time to time. He knows how we treat our spouses or those in our families and those we're called to love selflessly and sacrificially. He sees when we're selfish and self-centered. He knows about everything and he knows it all, but he still loves us. Let me read some scriptures. Uh, 1 John 4, 10. In this is love, not that we love God but that he loved us. Well, did he love me when he knew that I was a sinner and I was born into sin and I am a sinner, I sin because I'm a sinner. I was born into iniquity. Does he still love me? It says, and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He knows about your sin and aren't you grateful? He doesn't just know about it. He provides a solution to it. Uh, Romans 5, 6 through 8. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You know, he died 2,000 years ago, but he still had you on his mind on that cross and all of your sins, past, present, and future. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Okay, I'll die for certain people. Depends how righteous they are, how much I like them. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would dare to die, but God demonstrates his love toward us in this, that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, he's saying there, listen, you're not a righteous man, you're not a good man, you're not a righteous woman, you're not a good woman, you're a sinner. And God loved you still and sent his son to die for you and for me. That's amazing grace, isn't it? So Jesus passed by, divine appointment. He saw them and he sees us as he saw Levi and all of his sin good bad and ugly then he called him and he said follow me follow me Ephesians 1 4 through 5 says just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will Do you know when he decided to choose Levi to follow him with that divine appointment before the foundations of the world? You know when he chose you to to turn from your sin and turn to him? He had written your name already in the Lamb's book of life before the foundations of the world. You say, whoa, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I can't comprehend it. But what an amazing gift that we have been given if it was because of us we would have never received the gift that we have received Romans 8 30 moreover whom he predestined those he also called whom he called those he also justified and whom he justified anyone justified here these he also glorified wait a second I'm not glorified yet I'm still in a state of sanctification But it says in Romans 8.30 as if it's already happened. That's how sure you can believe that if he's brought you and justified you and called you and predestined you, he's going to glorify you as well. He's going to persevere you and I to the end. Aren't you grateful that the reason you are where you are today in your spiritual walk and you will end up where you need to be is not because you're holding tightly to his hand, but he's holding tightly to your hand and holding tightly to my hand. That's amazing grace. And so he called him, and then guess what? What did Levi do? He got up. He left the tax office. He left, I mean, there's a lot of money in your, I mean, in your pocket, right? This is a good living, right? I mean, he was shunned by his family, I can imagine, in order to to make all of this money and to work for Rome and to gain as much money as possible. And he left it all to follow Jesus, what would motivate Levi to live such a wonderful life? It's like the American dream. 
You got all the money in your pocket that you could imagine. I mean, you've got the white picket fence. You've got the beautiful house. You've got everything you could ever dream or imagine and give it all up for Jesus. Why did he do that? Well, John 10, 27 to 30 says this, my sheep hear my voice. Is it worth it to give it all up? to follow Jesus? Is it worth it to give up the comforts of this world to follow Jesus? Is it it worth it to give up your sinful lifestyle and your fleshly desires to follow Jesus? Is it worth it to lose everything in this life in order to follow Jesus? My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life. Oh, it's worth it. And they shall never perish. It's worth it. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. It's worth it. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Man, is it worth it. John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up the last day. Why is Jesus called a friend of sinners? Well, because he calls sinners to follow him. And if you're here today and you would testify, you got a testimony. I am a a sinner. I was a sinner, but Jesus called me out of the pit of my depravity, called me out of my old way of life, called me to follow him, to repent, to turn from my sin and to turn to him and give up the, the, the treasures of this world for the eternal treasures of heaven can you picture it though for a moment like what Levi did like he it was I don't think it was comfortable for him to leave the comforts of his lifestyle to follow Jesus and I want to just bring it in and just make it real practical for us because if you're going to follow Jesus and you're going to count the cost of following Jesus you got to step outside of your comfort zone and be willing to serve him but I want to tell you if ever you step outside of your comfort zone or you try to step outside of your comfort bubble it's difficult I don't know about you, but I, when I, if I'm sitting somewhere and I'm on the couch and my wife tells me, hey, take out the trash, listen, Newton's first law, things in motion continue in motion. Those that are not in motion, I mean, you just want to sit there, right? And so if Jesus calls you to follow him, let me tell you, I would rather sit in my comfortable seat and not go anywhere. But maybe... Just maybe Jesus has not just called you to follow him, but in very practical ways, maybe he's called you to serve him in the local church and say, hey, why don't you get up out of your seat in your comfort zone and serve our children's ministry? Maybe Jesus is calling you to get up out of your seat and leave where you're comfortable and to go off and serve with our student ministry. Can I, can I share some needs? One of our needs is um, we need high, uh, for high school, high school gals leaders who are going to pour into the next generation of students. If you're here today and you would say, hey, that makes me a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to step outside of my comfort zone and I'm going to follow Jesus. Maybe you're here and, 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 and it's comfortable not to say hi to your neighbors or to turn the conversation towards spiritual things, but maybe the Lord is challenging you to get out of your comfort zone. Maybe out on a Saturday morning, Think to yourself, hey, I'm just going to enjoy my Saturday. Maybe he's asking you to sacrifice your time and your comforts to go and talk to your neighbors and reach them for the cause of Christ. Maybe the Lord might be challenging you to serve in some of the different ministries of our church. Uh, we serve the homeless out in Glenwood on Saturday. Saturdays at four. Can I tell you, talk about a, a terrible time to go out on a Saturday? I mean, Saturday's my day to relax and to be with the family. And then four o'clock, you want me to go out when I've got better things to do with, you know, I could go do this or I can do that. Come on, can we be honest? That's a difficult time to go out and make some sacrifices, but maybe the Lord's calling you to step outside of your comfort zone and serve in different ministries. I'm just giving you a few examples, but the Lord might be impressing on your heart to reach somebody. There might be a name that you think of as we're talking here. And just as Jesus called Levi to follow him, he got up from his seat and the comforts of his life, and he went and he followed Jesus and he left everything 
behind. Would you be willing to leave your occupation to follow Jesus? If Jesus was like right now, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your work. I want you to leave the American dream and lifestyle. And I want you to go and be a missionary in Africa. Would you be so willing to get up and go? That's what Levi was willing to do. Wow, when you sit, put it that way, it gets a little bit more challenging. And I'm telling this to myself and I'm starting to feel it. Lord, what are you impressing on my heart to do? What does it mean to really deny myself take up my cross and follow Jesus. Or maybe it's just as simple as saying, hey, when I get home at the end of the day, I'm not there to be served, but to serve just as my Savior served and gave his life as a ransom for many. Jesus called sinners to be disciples. That's why he was called a friend of sinners. If I could give us a few applications. Number one, hear the call to follow Jesus. Hear the call. If you're here today, you may have said there was a moment in my life where I felt that initial call to follow him. I want to open up for discussion. Do you remember how or who God used to first call you to himself? And if you've strayed, do you remember throughout your life, do you remember how or who God used to call you back to himself with? Do you remember that? How did God call you? What divine appointment did he set up for you? Anyone want to share? Wow. Talk about uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> that's sacrificial, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's great. That's great, Ty. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I'm hearing right now is it might be right now and it might be you. Sure, sure. The Lord might be speaking in and through his word right now and saying, follow me. Follow me. Yeah. Yeah. Mary. Siblings are a great blessing from the Lord. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. God can use your children. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Very neat. And he's a oh, neat. So those three things are kind of common, and you know, I just you can put the stories together however you want to, but I just think it's kind of um, unique that she got her book in the mail today on her brother's birthday. Yeah. You know, it just <laughs> how it all kind of. It's together. Yeah. Oh, neat, neat. Love it. Yeah. Anyone else want to share? Yeah. 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 Bill. Some of you will remember years ago there was a man named John Massey here in the church. And we were looking on the layup. He was on one side and I was on the other side. And he looked at me and he said, Bill. I think God's trying to tell you something. <laughs> and I said, I think he is. And I started coming to church with John. And I'm still here. Amen. Oh, I love it. The mill goes down. Yeah. He retired. What a divine appointment. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Oh, very neat. So hear the call of the Lord's calling you, even right now. Follow the call. Follow him. Give up your comforts and your bubble that you're in and follow Jesus no matter the cost. Heed the call. What does that mean for you? Consider how God is impressing it on your heart. Dream 
big God-sized dreams because we've got a God who can answer them in accordance with his will. You say, man, seeing this person come to faith, that seems impossible, but God is in the business of making the impossible possible, especially when it comes to salvation. And then thirdly, share the call to follow Jesus. What a privilege we have as followers of Jesus as he called folks to follow him, we call people not to follow us, but to follow him. And we can say it's worth it. Give it all up and it's totally worth it. You may think what's valuable in this world is going to bring you ultimate satisfaction, but no career, no amount of money, uh, nothing in this world can satisfy like God can in Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Why? He's put eternity in our hearts. Are you gonna enjoy the temporary pleasures of this world and exchange it for the eternal pleasures of God? They don't even compare. And when we set our perspective right, man, what a blessing we have. Um, we shared some of the divine appointments people have had with us. Can you, does anyone wanna share any divine appointments you've had with others? As you are going about your day-to-day -day business and all of a sudden you see somebody or you run into somebody and God gives you the opportunity to talk with them and minister to them. Anything happened this week or in the past month or this past year? Anyone want to share? These are fun. Yeah, Lisa. I was in the pool this morning and I was talking to a woman. And I don't know how we got to the conversation, but we started talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. And I was referencing, you know, being in the furnace. And she didn't remember that story. And I was like, are you familiar with the Bible? So, so yeah, she's familiar with mm -hmm. the Bible, but she didn't remember that story. And I was talking about, I was telling her about how they came to be thrown into the furnace. And, you know, it's just that I was able to talk to her about it. It's like I didn't even think about it before or during. I just, it wasn't until after I was just like, oh, wow, that was just so natural. I mean, it's, and it's not like I said, oh, you must repent. But it's like, as I'm talking to people, I'm given an opportunity to bring up God. It's organic. It's just like, I'm slipping in it. I'm not bashing people over the head. I'm not shaking them. It's like, oh my God, I'm a parent. <laughs> I'm just saying, look what God can do. Look what yeah. he did. Yeah. And look at, what was it? It's about the part, you know, my God is able. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those divinely orchestrated conversations. Yes, yes. Jerry. Um, I, I, mine kind of follows what she said. Oh, yeah. It seems like I have the most impact on someone when I'm totally unprepared. Oh, yeah. It just happened to be a certain spot. And one of them was in May. I was in the hospital for two nights. And I had the same male nurse that came in with those uh, I love it.
Yeah. What a powerful testimony. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so why is Jesus uh, described as a friend of sinners? Well, because he calls sinners to be his disciples, to follow him. Secondly, because he dined with sinners. He didn't just call like one guy to follow him like Levi. Uh, he called folks to follow him. And Levi's life was so changed, so transformed that he was like, I need to tell my friends. Like, God has changed my life in such a dramatic way through Christ's calling on me that I need to tell all the tax collectors and all the sinners in town about who Jesus is. And what we get to read about next is Jesus is invited as the honored guest to Levi's house, and he invites all his friends. Because he's like, God changed my life. He can do it for you too. And everyone wants to hear about this Jesus. And so there's a, a big dinner. And we read about that in the next verse, verse 15. It says, now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house. Now, that's not the first time Jesus visited a disciple's house. If you remember, he had visited in chapter 1, Peter and Andrew's house. And while he was there, he also healed Peter's mother-in-law, who was, had a fever, and so Jesus, this is teaching us a little bit about discipleship, um, shows us what it means to make disciples. He goes to their houses and he builds trust with them. I was talking to someone over the past few weeks and they had mentioned to me as you pour into someone else's life and you meet with them weekly or you um, have conversations with them in the coffee shop or uh, wherever you're at, you know that you're making good steps towards really building rapport and trust with that person when they invite you over to their house. And when they invite you to your, their house, you know, unbelievers, those who don't know the Lord, maybe a family member, a friend, and they say, hey, come and talk to me where I'm at, it makes a big difference. Jesus went to their house. He, it didn't stop him. And so he goes over to his house, and the text goes on to say, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. Okay, the word sat there in the original Greek is uh, reclined. When you sat down for one of these meals, you didn't sit like we do around a table. You reclined. You had one, you read about that like at the Lord's table. You know when John, the disciple whom Jesus loved in the Gospel of John, leaned back on Jesus' breast. It was because they were leaning and you got a circle and he's just leaning back. Jesus lounging around with a bunch of tax collectors and Sinners. Who are we talking about when we're talking about tax collectors and sinners? Who are we differentiating them from? Because it isn't everyone a sinner. Everyone's a sinner, but some are self-righteous sinners. Um, we read about who these sinners are. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14, it says this, and he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. We actually quoted this Sunday. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee prayed thus with himself, God, thank you that I'm not like other men. And then he listed those men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even this tax collector. So when, G when it's mentioned here, tax collectors and sinners, we're talking about all those folks. We're talking about the folks in society who are not just known as sinners, they're known as bad sinners. Can we be honest? There are some folks, it's one thing for me to have my sin, you know, I struggle with this or that, but that sin, that's a whole nother thing. You know, thank God I'm not like them. I've got my problems, okay? I can admit that, but thank God I don't have problems like her. I don't have problems like him. And so when we're talking about those sinners, it's looking at everyone else who's got the problem except for us. You talk to a lot of self-righteous people, they will tell you, hey, the reason the world has problems is because everything going outside there. You know, if they just fix this or they fix that, and the Bible tells us, 
You're the problem. I'm the problem. If you want to fix the problem of the world, take a look from the inside out and only Jesus Christ can change and transform a heart from the inside out. And so he's lounging, he's reclining with tax collectors and sinners. And then it says, um, um, and his disciples, for there were many and they followed him. So not only did he eat with them, they started following him around. <laughs> So if you want to know who Jesus is, consider who's around him. And here's the problem with the self-righteous people. They're thinking to themselves, hey, he is being corrupted by the presence of these sinners and these tax collectors. Verse 16, and when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? So they don't ask Jesus. <laughs> the scribes and Pharisees, they ask disciples of Jesus, why are you following this guy? Peter, Andrew, James, and John, why would you leave your way of life to follow this guy when all he does is hang out with tax collectors and sinners? Do you really know who you're hanging out with? Why was Jesus called a friend of sinners? Well, because he dined with them. He spent time with them. If I could give just a few reasons why Jesus dined. The first one is the reason Jesus dined with sinners was not to, cond was not, was not to condone what God condemned. As he ate with these sinners, he wasn't condoning dishonesty or sinful lifestyles, adultery or sexual immorality. Now, let me read to you about the heart of God. Psalm 5, 5 says, the boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all, er all workers of iniquity. Psalm 11.5 says, The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. And so the reason why Jesus hung out with them was not to condone what God condemns in the Bible. So that's the first thing. Secondly, the reason Jesus dined with sinners was to call them and us to repentance. He, what was the gospel we heard the kingdom of God is at hand. The time is fulfilled. Repent, turn from your sin, and believe on the Lord Jesus. So what have we been called to do? We've been called to reach sinners lost who are living in brokenness in this world, who are hopeless because they're pursuing this path or that path, and it's not going to yield the joy and satisfaction that they're looking for, and we can call them to follow and trust in Jesus as their Savior and Lord, but how can we if we never talk with them? You know, there are some people that we would say, hey, I just don't like to be around them. And there's a part of the truth to say, hey, I need to protect myself and I need to protect my family and I need to be in the world but not of the world, right? But we're in the world and as we are protecting ourselves from the influence of the world, we're called to reach the lost for Christ. And that, to do that, you've got to get to know the lost, Got to get to know sinners like you and me so that they can also trust in Jesus as their Savior and Lord. I want you to know this. For the Pharisees and the scribes, it was a surprise to them, but it shouldn't have been. Did you know that God had given Israel a purpose? And the purpose that Israel was given was to be a beacon of light to the nations. Israel was to make the other nations jealous of their relationship with the one true God. In, in Isaiah 42, six through seven, it says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. So they were to make the other nations jealous. So they said, I want to get to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want to experience what Israel has. But what did Israel do? They sinned. They ended up worshiping the gods of the surrounding nations and participated in spiritual adultery and they were disciplined accordingly and it was fulfilled in, in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. To open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. And so why did Jesus come? That's, he came for that purpose was to shine the light to the lost, to the Gentile nations. Hey, if you want to know what it is to have a real relationship with God, repent of your sin and believe in me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Not just another option, not just another opinion. I'm the way, the truth, and 
the life. If I could open up for discussion here, it would be this. How can we follow Jesus' example? What does that look like? If Jesus dined with sinners, what does that mean for us? And if I could ask it this way, because it's challenging, how do you balance not condoning sin while also calling folks to repentance as you dine with them? What's that balance like? Do you find that challenging? What's, what's our example that we're to follow? What's the practical example? What practical ways can we follow Jesus' example who dined with sinners? I'm just, talk, just talking about sinners. I'm talking about the worst of the worst sinners. The ones that society says, for, you know, no, they're too far lost. He might have some hope, but that person, no, 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 we can't save that guy. What's, what's our example? How do we follow it? Yeah, so guarding my own heart, my self-righteous attitude, because I can get there, yeah. Humility, sure. Yeah, yeah. Humility and following the example of Christ. Yeah, he gave us the, the ultimate example. Any parents in the room? Young kids or older kids or out of the house kids? How do you protect your kids if you're going to spend time with sinners? What does that balance look like? We got young ones, they need some advice, okay? Like how much do I spend time with sinners while also wanting to guard the hearts of my children? What does that balance look like? Prayer. prayer. Yeah, so seeking prayer and wisdom from the Lord. God, what does that balance look like? Communication. Communication. Well, Yeah, so ongoing conversations with our kids and as we minister to others, we're setting the example for them, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. So have a healthy balance. Know kind of your roles and responsibilities as you're with your kids and uh, set proper precautions if you need to. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a real question. Like, how do, you, how do we follow Jesus' example who, who dined with sinners? And what's that look like to balance that of saying, I'm not here to condone that lifestyle, but I'm also here uh, to share the good news of the gospel, to call folks to repentance, because that's what we've been called to do. It's one thing to just have dinner with somebody and ha have dinner with them for 15, 20 years and never get to spiritual matters. <laughs> it's another thing to turn the conversation towards spiritual things, but what's that balance look like? And I think it's challenging. I think Ty had mentioned his youth pastor would come over to his house and say, hey, 
I'm not, I'm not leaving till you come with me. And that's difficult. That'll cost you something, right? Uh, and um, it seems to have paid off, Ty. <laughs> What a, what a great example for us. So um, Jesus was called a friend of sinners because he called sinners to follow him. He dined with sinners. And lastly, as we close our text in verse 17, the purpose for why he came is stated um, in order to call those who are in need of repentance. Call those who not are well, but those who are sick. Verse 17 says this, and when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's Jesus' purpose statement. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. Why did Jesus call his disciples? He called them to follow him so that he could make them fishers of men. So it's kind of weird if you have a doctor and a uh, friend who comes up to you and says, man, all these sick people keep coming to the office. I'm just tired of them. You know, they're bringing in their flu and their other sicknesses and, you know, they're going to spread it to everyone. Well, that's kind of weird because the purpose of the physician is to come and help those who are sick and those who are needy and to bring a solution. Jesus says, I'm the great physician. I'm the great physician and I didn't come to reach those who think they're righteous and spiritually well, but those who know they are spiritually sick. That's why the tax collector is so much closer than the self-righteous Pharisee because the self-righteous Pharisee thinks he's already righteous based on his good deeds or her good deeds, right? And so if we could come to a place of saying, you know, I come to you, Lord, with nothing in my hands. I bring only to your cross I cling. That is the only way that we can come and receive salvation and the gift of everlasting life. The verse concludes and says, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Uh, let me share with us, Jesus came to call sinners to repentance, the bad news and the good news. First, the bad news is that all, all sin and deserve to be punished. Every single one of us. Doesn't matter what family you grew up in or background that you have, whether you were raised in a Christian family or not, even in Twin Rivers, we're reminded that we're all sinners. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What's the consequences? What's the punishment? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Secondly, the good news is that there is no sin beyond God's forgiveness. There's no sin beyond God's forgiveness. Um, Romans 8, 1 through 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You may be here and you say, there are certain sins I know that God can forgive, but can he forgive that sin? Or can he forgive that sin? There's no sin that God cannot forgive. The only sin that is the unforgivable sin is unbelief. Blasphemy of, Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When you call what the Holy Spirit's doing the work of Satan, ultimately that's unbelief and you can't find forgiveness from that. But there's no sin that cannot be forgiven. Yeah. We're in this world, Lord, and we're not of this world. Yeah. For instance, there's restaurants that years ago I would not go into because they served liquor and alcohol there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So just finding that balance, finding that balance, certainly. And then the good news is this, not only that no sin is beyond God's forgiveness, no person is beyond God's forgiveness, even you, even me. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. Amazing grace. Do you believe that? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. Now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. There's a lot of wretched sinners all around us who are just like 
us. But Christ called us out. He set up divine appointments for us. There are people whom God used to speak into our lives. Even when it was uncomfortable, they went and they pressed forward and they obeyed God and they were available. God's called us to follow Christ's example, to seek and to save the lost. You know, he's the great physician. What are you and I? We're the physician assistant. Have you ever met a physician assistant? You go into the doctor's office and the physician assistant is there and you say, well, I was looking for the doctor and they say to you I can do everything a doctor can do but I'm under the authority of the doctor so I can prescribe you anything I can uh, give you some recommendations to this person or that person I could prescribe you out but I work under the authority of the great physician you're a physician assistant you work under the authority of the great physician and you have the opportunity to point people to Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of everlasting life. Can we pray? Father, thank you that you don't just save us, but you use us. And you've called us to not only serve you and follow you, but to serve those around us. There are those who are needy, those who need to hear the good news of the gospel, those who need to be prayed for. There are those, Lord, even in our church who uh, need to be poured into in the next generation, kids or students, Father. Uh, there are those who are needy, Lord, and we just pray, Father, that you would challenge us this coming week as, or throughout the rest of this week as we serve you faithfully. Uh, Lord, when you set up those divine appointments, may we be ready and available to be used by you. We're just ordinary people that you use to do extraordinary things, and we pray that we would be available to Share the truth of who you are with those who need it. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would challenge our hearts, that you would remove anything that would hinder us from being effective fishers of men, whether it be fear, whether it be uh, a selfishness or a self-centeredness or a self-righteousness, Lord. Help us to turn from those things so that we can be willing, ready, and available to be used by you. Thank you for the grace you provide us in Jesus. It is truly amazing. We pray that we can meditate on that the rest of this week. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.